Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing well. And if you're new here on this channel, I'll be doing IGCSE physics related content. So I'll be doing past papers, topic questions, and overall revision. So if you're interested, make sure to subscribe so you wouldn't miss any upcoming content. So in this video, I'll be going through the IGCSE physics paper four for the October, November, 2023 series. So this paper is for one hour, 15 minutes, and it has 80 marks. So make sure to watch until the end, so because I'll be going through every, each and every question and I'll be telling you how to solve each and every one of them. So let's start with the first question. Question number one. A girl holds a rubber ball out of a window of a tall building. The mass of the ball is 0 0.2 kgs. The ball is at rest 10 meters above a con concrete path. Calculate the gravitational potential energy of the ball relative to the concrete path. So GPE, the formula is mass times gravity times height. So mass is 0 0.2 times gravity, which is always 9.8, times the distance, which is 10. So we just multiply them, 0 0.2 times 9.8 times 10. That would give us 19.6 joules, two marks. Part B, the girl releases the ball and it falls towards the path. The ball strikes the path and bounces vertically upwards. Figure 1.1 shows the ball falling down. Okay, so we have the ball and the girl throws down the ball downwards. It bounces and goes back again. The speed of the ball immediately before it strikes the path is 14 meters per second. So this is the speed immediately before the initial speed. And the speed of the ball immediately after is 12 meters per second. So now we're asked to find the kinetic and calculate the kinetic energy of the ball immediately after it strikes the concrete path. So the formula for kinetic energy is going to be half of mass times velocity squared. So the mass is, we know it's 0 0.2, so it's going to be half times 0 0.2 times the speed after. So that's going to be 12. That's going to be 12 squared. So half times 0 0.2 times 12 squared. That would give us 14.4 joules. Part two, show that the change in momentum of the ball when it bounces off the path is 5.2 kilograms meter per second. So to prove that, change in momentum, which is mass times final velocity t minus mass times initial velocity. So the mass is 0 0.2 times final velocity, which is 14, minus, we have the mass, which is 0 0.2 again, times the f initial velocity, which would be 12. But then since uh, it's acting in the opposite direction, it's going to be minus 12. So now we just calculate this, 0 0.2 times 14 minus 0 0.2 times minus 12. So when we do that, we would get 5.2 kilogram meter per second. The same as this one. So that's our answer. Part three. The ball is in contact with the path for 0 0.25 seconds. Calculate the average resultant force on the ball when it's in contact with the path. So we know that the formula for force is also the change in momentum over time. So from the previous question, we know that the change in momentum is going to be 5.2. The time is 0 0.25. So 5.2 over 0 0.25, that would give us 20.8. So 20.8 
newtons. Now we can round this to two significant figures and write 21, but either way it's fine. Question number two. A copper cooking pan contains water. Figure 2.1 shows the pan on a hot plate of cooker. Copper is a metal, yeah. Thermal energy is conducted through all solid by lattice vibrations. Describes, describe one other way in which thermal energy is conducted through the copper. So to answer this question, first let's look at the structure of copper. So in copper, we have positive ions in regular arrangement. So these are all positive ions. And in bet between them, we have what we call delocalized electrons. Now these electrons could move freely over everywhere and they can carry, they can gain thermal energy and they can move throughout the copper to transfer thermal energy. So what we can say is copper has free or delocalized electrons. Delocalized electrons. And then these electrons, they gain thermal energy. Energy. So the delocalized electrons, they move throughout the copper to transfer energy. So they move throughout the copper, transferring energy. And this would get us three marks. Part B, the outside surface of the cooking pan is kept clean by regular polishing. Explain one other advantage of keeping the surface of the pan shiny. So we know that shiny surfaces are poor emitters of radiation. So we can say shiny surface are poor emitters. And because of that, there would be less heat loss or we can say less energy loss. That's going to be your answer. Part C. The thermal energy passes into the water through the base of the pan. Identify the main method by which thermal energy is tr transferred throughout the water. Now this is going to be convection. So convection is where by thermal energy is transferred through liquids, unlike conduction, which is thermal energy transferred through solids. Next question. Question three. Liquids are difficult to compress while gases can be compressed easily. Explain in terms of particles why it's difficult to compress liquids. To answer this question, let's look at the particle arrangement of liquids. So in a, in a liquid, the particles are fairly close to each other. And there's going to be repulsion forces between these particles. So that after, so they cannot be compressed fully just like gases can because gases are particles which are very far away from each other. So they can be compressed. But liquids, particles are close to each other. Are close each other so th there would be force of repulsion so they can't be compressed there would be forces of repulsion this would pr prevent them from being compressed part B figure 3.1 shows a rectangular block floating in water the density of the water is 1000 kilogram per meter cubed so we can see this rectangular block, it's floating in water, and then only 0 0.8, 0 0.087 meters is under the water. The area of the base of the block is 0 0.14. 0 0.0, 0 
0.014, sorry about that. The base of the plug is at a depth of 0.087 meters below the surface of the water. Show that the pressure due to the water at the base of the plug is approximately 850 pascals. Now pressure in liquid is density times gravity times height. So density is given, which is 1000, gravity 9.8, and the height, we'll be taking this height because it's only 0 0.087 meters below the water. So 0 0.087. Now when we multiply this, we would get 852.6. Now this is approximately equals to 850 when we round it. Part two, calculate the force F on the base of the block caused by the pressure given in P1. So we know that pressure equals force over area. We can rearrange this formula. So it would be force would be pressure times area, which would equal to 850 times 0 0.014. So when we do that, we will get 12 newtons. Part three, the force is equal to the weight of the block. Calculate the mass of the block. So we know that weight is equal to mass times gravity. So weight is 12 newtons. And then mass is, that's the one we have to find. And the gravity is 9.8. So divide both sides by 9.8. So the mass would be 12 over 9.8. That would give us 1.2 kilograms. That's going to be our mass. Next question. Question four. A radio transmitter is very tall, thin cylinder. It is prevented from falling over by wires, which have one end fixed on the transmitter and the other fixed onto the ground. The ends of the wire in the ground are long distance from the transmitter. Figure 4.1 shows the transmitter and the two wires. So we have one transmitter in the middle, and then we have two wires supporting it. The center of the gravity of gravity G is shown in figure 4.1. So here the center of gravity, state what's meant by the center of gravity. It, the center of gravity is a point on an object where the weight acts on. So a point on an object where the weight acts. Part two, explain why the radio transmitter without the wires is very unstable structure. Because a small tilt or a small movement would result in it toppling over. So a small tilt will topple it. Because the, the base is very thin, so a small movement from above would cause it to fall. Part B, wire W is under tension and it exerts a force of T on the transmitter. On figure 4.1, mark an arrow to show the force T exerted by a wire W on the transmitter. So to draw this, let me erase this first. So it would be something like this, a straight line pointing to the ground, and then would have an arrow headed there. Part two. The force T produces a moment on the transmitter about its space. Describe how the moment produced by T is calculated and indicate on figure 4.1 what is meant by any other term in the description. So we know that moment is equals to force times perpendicular distance. 
so it would become force times distance so now we have to indicate this on the diagram so this tension is also the force and the distance between them this is a perpendicular distance d but the so, so but if you want the force to be perpendicular we have to find this force so the downward force which is perpendicular to the distance that's going to be rf and, and this downward force is exerted by wire w which is also the tension part c the radio transmitter uses radio waves to transmit radio and television programs state one other use of radio waves one simple use which we do we use every time is wi-fi we're done with question four question five many methods of generating electrical power involve the use of water describe one method of generating electrical power from energy stored in water so let's try to visualize this so one of the method in which water can be used is we can have a dam which is full of water and the water can be released at times and then the water would be released and then at the end there would be a turbine and when water hits the turbine the turbine would turn it would start rotating and then it would drive a generator behind which would produce electricity so we just have to describe that so we have water stored on high ground is released and turns the turbine and then after that the turbine drives a generator and this method is called hydropower the method of generating electricity by using water Part B. For the method you chose in A, state one advantage and one disadvantage of generating electricity this way. So, one advantage is it doesn't produce any pollutant. Produce pollutants. And then the disadvantage is going to be it's expensive to build because dams are very expensive to build if to build part c state two method of generating electrical power from which the main source of energy is not the sun so the two are the we have nuclear power and also geothermal power because nuclear power uses uh, the breaking down of an atom atomic nucleus to generate electricity and geothermal uses heat generated in from inside the earth Let's move on to question six a page of printed text is placed 18 centimeters from a converging lens of focal length 35 centimeters figure 1.1 the scale diagram of the arrangement with each of the two principal focuses of the lens leveled if so these are the two focus points focal points part a a length of one centimeters of on the scale diagram represents an actual length of five centimeters so this is one centimeters it would represent five centimeters in real life by drawing on 6.1 look at the image of the page produced by the lens and label it I. 
So whenever we're trying to locate the image of an object, what we can do is first we draw a straight horizontal line to the center and after that we make that line pass through the focus. Sorry about my line, let me draw it again. So we made it we make it pass through the the focal that the focal point. Let me try to draw it again. So once it, it has passed through the focal lens, we draw another another line which passes through the center of the lens over here. And as you can see, this lines will never meet. So when that happens, what we can do is we extend those two lines, but then it's going to be virtual. So we can use dotted rays. And then where, where this two dotted rays meets, that's where our image is. So this is our image, which is I. And we can also do the same for the lower part. So we can draw a line through the center. And then after that, we draw a horizontal line going to the middle. And then we, we make it pass through the focus. And then we, we can see that these two lines will never meet. So we can just draw virtual rays tracing backwards for both of them. And where those two lines meet, that's where we have our image. Part two, using figure 6.1, determine the actual distance of the image from the lens. So now I am not using an actual ruler, so this might, mine might be a bit off, but then what we can do is we measure this distance, D, and then since one centimeter in the figure is equals to five centimeters in actual size, so just multiply the value get here by five. So th when we do that, we can get the values of 35.5 up to 38.5. And any value between these is correct. Part B, converging lenses can be used as magnifying glasses. St state whether the image produced when the lens is used as a magnifying glass is real or virtual. So as I've mentioned earlier, it's going to be virtual. It's because we have many reasons why it's it's virtual. The one is because the image formed is not using real rays. So we can write image isn't formed. using real race. That's going to be our answer. Part C. Suggest how someone who is long-sighted may benefit from using a converging lens. So let me ex first explain about long-sightedness. So we have VI over here, and then we have a lens, and then we have the retina which is where the image is formed. So the problem is, with long sightedness is when we have a near object, the ray would, would refract because of the lens, but then the image would be formed behind the retina. So that person wouldn't be able to see clearly. But then when we have a lens in between, when we have a converging lens in between, the object would be diffracted twice. So it would be diffracted twice. Let me redraw that. So we can have this object. So it would be diffracted twice. So the image would form exactly at the retina. That's the use of the lens to a long-sighted person. So we can write 
and long sightedness the image will be formed behind the retina so converging lenses lens would reduce the focal length reduce the focal length that's going to be our answer let's move on to question number seven question number seven a a plastic rod is uncharged when the rod is rubbed with a uh, woolen cloth the rod becomes negatively charged so that means it would have more negative charges than positive ones explain in terms of particles why the rod becomes negatively charged so that would mean the electrons would move to the rod from the cloth and the rod gains electrons let me try to draw that so let's say we have a cloth and then we have a rod and now when the cloth is rubbed over the rod we have electrons which should be transferred here into the rod so now we have more negative charge so that means the rod would be negatively charged part b figure 7.1 shows a negatively charged metal sphere s there is an electric field surrounding s explain why what is meant by an electric field so electric field is a region where an electric charge experiences a force so if we have like another negative charge over here and the electric field is big that means the negative charge would be repelled because it would experience the force so writing that, it's the region where an electric charge experiences a force. Part 2. On figure 7.1, draw the pattern of electric field surrounding sphere S and indicate its direction. So when we're drawing an electric field, it would always show the direction of movement of positive charges. That's what we're considering. So if we had a positive charge, the direction would be attracted to the negative charge. So this is the electric field. Because this positive charge would be attracted to the negative charge. So the direction would be toward toward the sphere but then we don't have to draw the positive charges part c figure 7.2 shows a small negative charge z placed near this near to the sphere s charge z experiences a force due to the electric field surrounding s on figure 7.2 draw an arrow to show the direction of this force on z so we know that z is negative charge because it's mentioned over here so like pole like charges repel each other so the direction would be it would be repelled but if z was a positive charge it would have been attracted to the sphere s let's move on to the next one number eight a cylinder is made of modeling clay the modeling clay is an electrical conductor figure 8.1 shows the cylinder and we know that the cylinder has a cross-sectional area this is the cross-sectional area and we have the length of the cylinder the cylinder is connected into a circuit figure 8.2 shows that the circuit also includes a battery of electromotive force 9 volts 
and resistor P. The resistance of P is 4 ohms and the current in P is 1.5. So resistance is 4 ohms and the current is 1.5 amps. Calculate the magnitude X of the charge that flows through P in 600 seconds. So we have the formula for current, which is equals to the charge over time. So current is 1.5 and the charge, we don't know that. And we have time 600 seconds. So the charge would be 15, I mean 1.5 times 600, which would give us 900 kilohms. That's our charge. Part two. The resistance of the cylinder of the modeling clay. So let's try to find the total resistance. So we have resistance total. So that would be V over I. So voltage is 9 volts of, from the question. And current is going to be 1.5 amps. Since it's a series circuit, current is equal everywhere. So over here, 1.5, it's also 1.5 everywhere. So when we divide that, 9 over 1.5, that would give us 6 ohms. Now that's the total resistance, so we can't use this as an answer. But the resistance of P is 4. So what we can do is 6 ohms minus 4 ohms to find the resistance of this one over here, the modeling clay. So 6 minus 4, that would give us... 2 ohms as our resistance. Let's move on to the next question, part B. The cylinder is removed from the circuit and replaced with a new cylinder made of the same modeling clay. The new cylinder is twice the length and has half the cross-sectional area of the first cylinder. Calculate the time that it now takes for the charge of magnitude x to flow through resistor p. So we know that when the length is increased, resistance is directly proportional. So because of the length, resistance would be times 2, because the length increased by 2. And the cross-sectional area is also halved. So when the cross-sectional area is halved, resistance is inversely proportional. So resistance is inversely to proportional to the cross-sectional area. So that means if this decreases, the resistance increases. So the cross-sectional area decreases by half, so resistance would be also times two. So the total resistance would be four times what we had before. So that means we would multiply our resistance we found over here, two ohms by four, so it would be 8 ohms. So the new resistance found is going to be 8 ohms. But now we're asked to find the time t. So to do that, first we have we have the formula I equals to Q over T. And we have the other formula voltage is equals to I R. So now we can substitute this formula into I. So it's going to be V equals to Q over T times R. So we have R, which is going to be 8 ohms times Q. So we have found Q, which is 900 times 900 over T, which we're supposed to find. And when doing the voltage, you have to be careful. Since we're asked, we're talking about resistor P, we have to find the voltage of resistor P. So that means it would be 1.5 times 4 because V equals IR. So it would be 6 volts. So that would mean we'd use 6 volts as our voltage. So we put 6. So 8, 8 times 900, that's going to be 7,200 over T. So we can cross multiply 60 equals 7200, both sides divide by 6, and then we would be getting 1200 seconds. 
So that's going to be our final answer. Question number nine. Many household smoke alarms contain a sample of radioactive isotope americum-241. Americum-241 is the isotope of the element American that has the nuclear number, mass number 241. State how the composition of the nucleus of American differs from that of a nucleus of American 242. So they're isotopes. That means they have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So we can say they have different number of neutrons. And if you want to be specific, we can say American 242 has one more neutron. Part 2. An atom of a different element has a nuclear number of 241. State two differences between the composition of the nucleus of this atom and a nucleus of American 241. So it's a different atom, so that means the proton number would be different. So we can say different number of proton. And we know that the nuclear number is the proton number plus the number of neutrons. So if the proton number is different, that means the number of neutrons will also be different. So we can say different number of neutrons. That's going to be our answer. Part B. American 241 decays to an isotope of neptium by an alpha particle emission. Complete the equation for this decay. So we know that an alpha particle, it has four as the nuclear number and it has two protons. We have to memorize this part. If we do, this kind of radioactive equations would be very simple for us. So that means if four of the, four of the nuclear number is for the alpha particle, that means we do 241 minus 4 to find for NP. So that would give us 237 above here. And then to find this one, we just add 93 plus 2, which is 95. And that's going to be our answer. Part 2. One reason for using an isotope that emits alpha particles in a smoke detector is that alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. Explain why alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. One of the reasons is alpha particles are heavier because they have a mass number 4. But beta particles, they're just high-speed electrons, so they don't have a mass number. So that means alpha particles have higher kinetic energy. Else have higher kinetic energy and they have more charge. So we can say they they have more charge. Those are the two reasons why they are more ionizing. The isotope of a nep neptunium produced by American 241 is also radioactive. The decay of this isotope of neptunium produces an isotope of procat procatinium which decays by beta emission. Beta particles are more penetrating than alpha particles. The half-life of neptunium is longer than 2 million years. Using this information, explain that the advantage of this long half-life for the use and safe disposal of a household smoke alarm. Okay, so the half life of Neptunium is longer than 2 million years. So that's a very long time. So that means it wouldn't decay, radio, uh, releasing radioactive rays for 2 million years. 
so we can say it has few emission per unit time and because of that it's not hazardous to humans or it's not dangerous so it's not dangerous to humans let's move on to question number 10 the milky way is one of many billion galaxies each galaxy contains many billions of stable stars stable stars transfer energy into space by emitting electromagnetic radiation from their surfaces describe what happens in the core of a stable star to release energy that is eventually transferred into space so what happens in a star is we have hydrogen and these two hydrogens would fuse to form helium. So we can write the hydrogen nucleus, nuclei, nuclei is the polar for nucleus, they fuse to form helium nucleus. By the process of nuclear fusion. process of nuclear fusion part b on the earth light from distant galaxies is observed and analyzed by astronomers this information is used to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the earth described how the observed light is different for when it was emitted so whenever an, let's say a galaxy or an object is moving further away that means the wavelength would increase and when the wavelength incre increases it would become more red shifted so when we look at the electromagnetic spectrum and when we look at the colors we have vib gior so that means the wavelength increases when we go down here so as the wavelength increases, it would become more red shifted. So we can say the wavelength is longer and it's more red shifted. Part two, state the quality that, that is the quantity that astronomers use to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away. We can write the redshift. Or we can also say the change in wavelength. Part C. The Hubble constant is equals to 2.2 times 10 to the power of minus 18 per second. Calculate the distance from the Earth of a galaxy that is moving away at a speed of 1.3 times 10 to the power of 7 meters per second. So the formula for Hubble's constants is going to be velocity over distance. So we can rearrange it so to find distance, which is going to be velocity over Hubble's constant. So we can have 1.3 times 10 to the power of 7 over 2.2 times 10 to the power of minus 18. So when we calculate this, it would become 5.9 times 10 to the power of 24. Part 2. Calculate an estimate for the age of the universe. Give your answers in years. So we know that the Hubble's constant is per second. The unit is per second. So to find age, what we can do is we do 1 over the Hubble's constant. So it would be 1 over 2.2 times 10 to the power of minus 18. So that would give us 
point five times ten to the power of seventeen. This would be our answer. But then the problem with this one is it's in seconds. So we have to change it into years. So to easily convert from seconds to years, so we have 3,600 seconds in one hour, so, but then we have 24 hours in a day, and we have 365 days in a year. So that would become 3,600 times 24 times 365, which would give us 31.5 million or times 10 to the power of 6. So we just divide this answer by 31.5. So that would give us 1.4 times 10 to the power of 10 years. So this is our time in years. Hmm. Seems like that was the last question. If you have enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe for more upcoming content. And if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, make sure to drop them down below in the comments. And thank you for watching.